So I don't have a whole lot of coffee today. I hope this. <laughs> I have a big coffee, but not really feeling it today. I don't know. Maybe I have something sticky on there. There's certain certain peanut butter flavored things that get a little sticky. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to anybody who's joining us out there because we can't see you yet, but we're coming soon. Okay. Oh, I think we can. I think we can see you. Not really feeling. And. Oops, I don't know. Maybe I have something sticking on there. Or something. <laughs> we're, yep, we're here. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm happily watching people roll into the room right now. Good morning. Happy Monday. Happy August. August. Yes. August. Finally. It's Wait. August, which means July is behind us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want, as people come into the room, tell me, did you have a good July or did you have a bad July? I had a bad July. Um, I'd like to hear how all of you did because if somebody has some sage out there, get your lighter or your match. The only sage I have is plastic and <laughs> I think that would harm me even further. But, uh, you know, we're off to a fresh start and... I would like to leave bad July juju behind. What do you think, Lori? I agree. I, I wouldn't say I had a bad July, but it was a crazy July. And Friday, July 31st, I was probably the most irritable I think I've ever been in my life. And I don't know why other than it was the last day of July and my head was like, be done already. So yeah. I woke up Saturday in a great mood. I was like, that that's behind us. So crazy month yeah. yeah it was crazy it was a crazy month and you know I've heard from a lot of people you know over the past week that you know it just seemed like something was in the air you know I mean it was a great month productive month but it was just weird and you know it's um you know just one of those things maybe you know we thought maybe mercury was in retrograde but then well my assistant said no so we lost that um, um, I hear I hear yeah. we're going into a full moon you know, and there's what three things that can relate to full moons, uh, witches, werewolves, and realtors. <laughs> because well, maybe we, it was the comet. Maybe the comet was like in route and just screwed up all the molecules in space or something. <laughs> I don't know. You know, and that is the second comet that has passed between the moon and the earth. You know, guys, uh, this, 2020 ain't looking so good because we got comets coming for us too. So, yeah. and we had earthquakes last week in San Fernando Valley. I didn't feel any. I don't know. Did you feel any, Lori? I didn't feel it, but I did come home Saturday night, I think it was. And this picture behind me was laying on the floor. Ooh. So I, it, that happened one other time and it was after we had had an earthquake. So I have a feeling we had an earthquake while I was out and I didn't feel it. I don't know. Well, everything, everything stayed on the walls here. So that's all good. Um, but it's, yeah, on to August. August, August is going to be good. There's no holidays that we're missing. Right. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, yes, I like Pam, Pam said the COVID comet. Yeah, this is COVID comet two. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of funny. They never really talk about it. You know, you hear about it after it happened and you're just like, how come nobody talks about this comet that, you know, but anyhow, well, we'll get off the comets and the COVID. Let's talk about what's going on, Lori. What did you learn Friday? Well, we had the CAR town hall meeting. I've, I've brought it up a couple of times. Uh, a lot of interesting things come up and, um, you know, one thing that caught my attention was the fact that uh, listing agents are getting very creative in how they want their offers to come in, and they're they're prompting buyers agents to do some things that we haven't done in a while. You mentioned a week or two ago about removing appraisal contingency uh, in the offer, so we're starting to see that. But a couple other things that have come up over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, one of them, I, I, 
I didn't even want to bring it up last week, but I'm going to go ahead and bring it up this week because I think that we all need to be aware of it. The reason I didn't want to bring it up is because I don't want to encourage people to do it. Um, but I think the reality is we need to watch out because people are doing it. And so uh, one of the things that that was mentioned that really shocked me was um, apparently, and it, it could very well be a regional thing out in the Inland Empire, because I haven't heard of it yet in Orange County, but uh, listing agents putting in a counter offer, passive removal of contingencies. We haven't had passive removal in at least a decade. I don't even remember which year they changed it, but I'm thinking maybe 06 or 08. Um, so if more you know, than put it in the comments and comments. <laughs> yeah, you know the answer. <laughs> well, and we'll see. We'll see who's the winner. <laughs> well, that would be a lot of work to track it down. Uh, I can find the info, but uh, yeah, somebody remembers. But um, you know, a question came up of you know, is that allowed? And the answer is yes. If you agree to it, if it's in a counter offer and you agree to it, then it's allowed. Um, now, the thing is, you wouldn't really want to do that. You wouldn't want your buyer to just essentially give up the contingencies the day they're due with no action um, unless they fully understand the effects of that. And we know that things can happen. There can be delays. And you certainly don't want, at least I think, you certainly don't want to just suddenly say, well, Tuesday the, the 3rd, the contingency is removed and you're still maybe negotiating something that's relevant related to an inspection or uh, something related to the appraisal. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I'm a little worried about that and just know that you have to, you have to educate your buyers, make sure they fully understand. And we are potentially going to have to be careful with, these negotiations because it's almost like anything goes. So that was one thing. Um, we all have heard about, you know, removing all the contingencies in the offer. There's actually a paragraph that allows you to do that. You know, if, if you're up for that, good. But again, make sure your buyer understands what that means. Uh, but the one that really caught my attention Friday was a discussion on non-refundable deposits. It's in the contract that it's not legal, but listing agents are asking for that now. And so it was a brief conversation, but it was a good reminder because when this contract changed in 2014, this was a big deal. This was specifically put in the contract that it was not allowed. I remember the brokerage I was with, we did a ton of training on it to make sure the agents understood this is not legal in California. And um, apparently agents are trying to be creative and bring that back. So they can put it in the offer or the counter offer, but it's not enforceable. So you might see it and you might just look at it and say, well, they think they're gonna get away with that, but it's not enforceable. Um, and of course, you know, always make sure with your deposit, you're mindful of liquidated damages, the maximum 3%, but also, you know, reminder, that's not for investors that's only for owner occupied. And um, um, also for uh, five units or more, it doesn't apply. So um, then another question came up and here's where it's like, if it looks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. The comment was, well, what about if we call it non-recoverable? Same thing. What about if we call, no, it's the same thing. So it's not, it's not an option. Um, but then we kind of moved to a discussion of, can a seller ask for the deposit to be released before close as a condition of accepting an extension? And the answer is yes. However, what we need to remember is this doesn't guarantee that the seller gets to keep that money. Um, and I'm trying to find the language in my notes here because I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, you know, the deposit can be released. It's still subject to the 3% liquidated damages. Um, releasing a buyer's deposit to the seller is not the same thing as allowing the seller to keep the deposit. So agents might attempt to get away with that and say, well, you released the deposit. Well, we released it, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't make it non-refundable. 
is basically what we need to know. So that was an interesting conversation. And there is a Q&A on this on CAR's website. And I can put the link in our, in our uh, chat. So what do you think? I think it sounds like we're turning into the Bay Area. That's what it sounds like. All of the crazy stuff always starts up in the Bay Area because of their uh, situations up there. Um, I Has anybody seen any, I, I know Harry said he had a passive removal in an offer in March. Uh, mm -hmm. However, they still requested active removal, which is kind of funny because they're trying, yeah. trying to have it both ways, I guess, I don't know. Um, we also had, uh, and Mary Jane, I'll get to yours. Um, but Ruth Bridge said, what would the point of a release deposit accomplish? Um, I think it's just to give them some assurance that you're attempting to move forward. You know, sometimes they need it for the HOA docs or, you know, maybe they need it in order to, to do those repairs. But I think it's more of a good faith gesture. Um, however, I would, I would believe that a listing agent that asks for that the listing agent and the seller probably interpret that as non-refundable. So I think it's, they just simply don't understand. So, you know, is there any benefit to doing it? There could be circumstances where it makes sense. If they actually need that, those funds to, to complete repairs, mm -hmm. you know, that might make sense, but otherwise it's most likely just, they're, they're not certain of, of the impact of that, the effects of that. And I think you would only be able to do something like that with a super savvy buyer. I yeah. mean, somebody that really understands all of the technicalities and, and everything, because, you know, there's so many people out there, especially, you know, I'm seeing so many first time buyers right now um, that you got to be really careful. You got to really take care of those people and not let them get in a situation because they can turn and say, but you told me to do it. And, you know, as, as Pam says, there's going to be realtor jail. Yeah, I really don't want to end up in realtor jail. I would rather err on the side of my person, not my, my client, not getting involved in the situation where we're going to be having a seller that is, you know, making these demands. And probably it's not the seller. We all know that, you know, we say, oh, well, the seller did this, the seller did that. We all know as the agents are driving the bus on this. Sellers don't come up with this stuff. You know, we, we see it happen. We hear about it. Say, hey, hey, I think I'm going to try that. You know, we, we recently had um, a conversation about escalation clauses. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because that's something I think we're going to see more of, which I ended up not doing it. I thought about doing it for a client. And I said, no, I'm not. Uh, there's too, too many risky things that we could get ourselves into. And I thought better of it and said, no, we're just going to, you know, throw the kitchen sink at the cellar and I mean, not like really throw the kitchen sink at the cellar. Uh, maybe if we didn't get our offer accepted, I would Then you'll but, end up in realtor jail if you throw the Yeah, sink. yeah, but bodily harm, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I was not prepared to talk about the escalation clause and I'll be That's honest, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, seriously. I'm not, I'm not very well versed on it because honestly, um, it's something I haven't seen in so many years that even when you mentioned it as a possible option that you might need to do, I mean, I kind of thought, well, she must know how to do it. I, I'm going to have to read up on it because I don't remember. And then literally the next day it came up on a call I was on and a mention of the Q&A. And I'm like, oh, perfect. I pulled up the q and I sent it to Lisa. I still haven't even read it. And the only thing I read on it had to do with, um, you know, your highest and best offer and, and your response. I don't remember the exact wording, but it's essentially, well, I'll do that. But by offering a thousand over your highest offer. And that was like question one, like, how does this work? And then there's like 12 other questions after that. So I don't know how it works. I don't really want to know how it works. <laughs> there, there is a Q and A on it. Um, if anyone needs to know how it works, I would recommend reading that and understanding it. Maybe even calling CAR to talk about it before you attempt to, to use it. I think the Q and A will really make you think or the FAQ or Q, whatever we want to call it today. Um, it made me think twice. And, you know, at first it sounded like a really good option, you know, because I mean, the, the, it was a great property and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to get this from a client? And then, you know, I started reading it and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, 
it's it's a jungle out there when it comes to the multiple offers. How are you going to be able to get your, you know, how do you how do you know what you're up against when you're in the highest and best situation, you right. know, and that's really the hardest part, you know, good communication between agents help. Sometimes that's very easily done. Other times, not so much. Um, you know, I had a great conversation with the agent that I almost threw the escalation clause at. And it was just like, you know, what are your expectations on highest and best? What, you know, where do we sit? How strong are we compared to the other offers? And, it, you know, we have to remember the offer information is not confidential. We can talk about the other offers unless your seller writes in there saying all offers be confidential. Um, you know, you're, you're helping your clients, you're helping the other realtor, and, and we are supposed to cooperate. And if, you know, just picking up the phone and making that call sometimes, um, and, you know, half the time people are going to say, I'm not going to tell you anything, which is like, fine, you know, you don't ask, you don't get. Um, sometimes it works out. And, you know, we found out we were in a strong spot. She gave us a window. Uh, well, seller would like to see this and that, and the other thing. And we had to do uh, appraisal contingency removal, which uh, that's getting super, 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 super common right now, at least in Orange County. Um, but, you know, it, it all worked. I just told my buyer, we got one shot and we've got to take it and let's just go, you know, go big or go home. And we're doing our inspection on Wednesday. So, you know, it's just one of those things. Go out there and be cooperative. And if you're a listing agent, you know, as Harry Solomon says, but I'm not going to say it, don't be a blank. Um, you know, just, we're all out here trying to take care of our clients and we should treat each other a little bit better. And hopefully maybe August will be treat another realtor nice and fair month. I think that would be that nice. Would be beautiful. <laughs> well, you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, how do you know what the what the highest offer is. And it was interesting because on, on a call a couple weeks ago, um, somebody asked something similar. And the note that I wrote was, it's okay to demand page one of the RPA for proof of other offers. And I thought, <laughs> well, we have the right to demand it, but I don't know if we're going to get it. I don't think I'd ask anybody. Only, you know, the only time I would ask anybody is, um, if I was doing an well, escalation clause, you have to, but, um, you know, I, it's, I don't think that any time that I've asked a listing agent, I've done it a few times. What do I have to be? Tell me, what do I have to be? Um, they always end up taking my offer because I always get my clients to come in higher than what they've got. And that's representing a buyer. Um, you know, I, I liked what this gal did the last time with the gave me a window. This is what the seller is looking for something between this dollar and that dollar. And it's like, wow, that's really helpful. Should I go in the low end of the range? Should I go to the high end of the range? Should I go to the middle? Maybe the range is beyond what we're comfortable paying. And, uh, you know, I thought that was kind of cool. I kind of like that. It wasn't, you know, playing the full deck, but uh, at least giving us, if we really want the house, we should be coming in somewhere in that window. And uh, it worked out really good. I thought, but yes, uh, yes, let's start a movement. Let's start a movement of being nice, cooperative, professional, ethical realtors. Wow. And it's Not so funny that. because, you know, the, the, the proper term is the cooperative agent. And sometimes the cooperative agent is not so cooperative. And so it is funny, you know, to kind of think about it when so much can just be discussed and worked out and that's where we have to check our egos we have to remember we're the messenger we go to our clients we educate them on the possible options we let them make their decision then we take that message back and deliver it to the other agent and that agent's job is to hear the information that they're they're being told and deliver that to the agent but so many times at that point that agent will just say well my client's not going to do that or we would never do that or you know, and they make the decision. We don't always know what our clients want. Sometimes we think we know what they want. Uh, they'll never do that. Well, you know what? Maybe their situation is a little more dire than they're letting on. And they, they are willing to do that because close is close enough sometimes. 
So I think sometimes, you know, when we, when we hear about agents who are just not communicating well with each other, it's, that's usually the reason. And, you know, I don't know how many times in my career I've heard now, well, you know, that was the transaction from hell. You know, you have to stop and think if every transaction you have is the transaction from hell, you might be the common denominator in that equation and you need to think about that and, and just try to figure out, you know, how can I communicate better? And even if you don't have problems, we still should always be looking for how can we communicate better? Because this isn't a zero sum game. This is how can both parties feel good about the outcome? And sometimes each party has to give a little and if there's kindness, then we can get there. We can get there. Very true. And more oh, soapbox for the day. Be kind. But, but it's true. It's true. It's, you know, I even now will tell listing agents when I'm writing an offer, all I'm looking for is a nice, smooth, downright boring escrow. <laughs> I, I, boring is good. Boring is a good thing. Um, you know, keeping, keeping egos in check. I think that that's really important. You know, a lot of us take everything so personally and it really isn't about us. It's about our clients. And uh, I have a question here, Lisa, how do you respond as a listing agent to these questions? And usually what I will do, um, number one, I tell people when the offers are gonna be presented. And I think it's really super, super important yes. that if you're gonna hold off and you're going to pull all of the offers that you need to let all the agents know that you're holding the offers until a certain date and you better stick to that date. And I always put on the um, contract the RPA when I presented the offer to my client because I don't want anybody saying I didn't do it. And, you know, then everybody knows. I think the most important thing is just being clear because we've all had the situation where you're the first agent in and you write the offer and you write a good one and you're like, hey, when am I going to hear from you? And, you know, days go by and you're like, uh, what's happening here? And by then you figured it out saying, you know, all you had to do is just tell me you're going to hold them to a certain day. Then I can call my client down because it's not so much about me. So they go, oh, my God, I'm looking for this. It's like I have a client sitting here. Wonder. They want an answer. They want to know, should we keep looking for property? Should we, you know, sit tight? We love this one so much. We're going to sit tight. But how long do we have to sit? Didn't we put an expiration time on this offer? It's past the expiration time. And we don't, as the agent for the buyer, we don't really look too good because we've got a listing agent who's not being cooperative and giving us a, a, a time frame that we can pass on to our client because we all remember what this is like. And if you haven't, if you don't remember what it's like to buy or sell a house, I suggest you put your house on the market and go try to find one right now. It will keep that experience. Usually it sticks with me from seven to 10 years. Every now and then it's like, you know, I think I need to move. So I know how bad this is and what I'm putting people through. And right now in the market we're in, we're causing a lot of stress that we do not need to cause for our clients. But Back to how do I deal with it when somebody's asking me? I just sit, tell them initially, you know, we've got X amount of offers already, X amount are over, write strong, but be prepared to go stronger because I will come back at the highest and best. And then basically it's just, let's see what the questions are, you know, because my job is to get the best offer with the best price and best terms in the quickest amount of time for my client. And I know a lot of people are, are saying in the thread here, you know, well, I'm not going to tell anybody. Well, if you do, maybe you can get your client a little bit more money. It tends to work out pretty well. You know, it's like, oh, I got to do that. Oh, OK. And if their client can't do it, then they're not going to do it. But give your client a chance. Helps my seller. Helps your buyer. They get what they want. And we're working together. And it is a win-win situation. You know, you don't want your buyer saying, you know, I missed out on that house. I would have paid more, you know, because, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to know what was that window we needed to come in. So I personally think cooperation is good. It is win-win. And, you know, uh, Mary Jane, I'm right there with you. It's all about walking away at the end of the day with a closed escrow where 
the agents are like, let's go have lunch. I just made a new friend. Uh, you got a home buyer that's just ecstatic saying, you know what, I maybe I thought I paid too much, but you know what, I'm so happy with my home. I don't care. I'm going to make money because the market's appreciating. And the seller who says, you know what, I did really, really good. And maybe they might even become friends too. You know, one nice little letter left with the keys, um, you know, can make a world of difference sometimes. And because this is a human business and we, we need to look at it as instead of being confrontational so much, you know what, it's much more fun when you're friends with other agents than it is having a target on your back. Yeah, there's no reason it, it needs to be a, a winner take all situation. You know, it's, we're, we're not negoti negotiating for hostages here. It's like, let's, let's try to make this work. Let's, let's go through a process where everyone at the end of the day is happy. And, you know, <laughs> when paperwork's missing, it's like, well, I can't go back to my clients. They hate me now. Why does your client hate you? They shouldn't hate you. If you're having proper conversations, setting expectations, the other agent shouldn't hate you. It doesn't have to be this difficult, you know? I mean, we, we are a people business, so we need to be able to talk to people properly, not just, you know, defend to the end. This isn't a video game. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of us take it really super personally. And, you know, and I always, I always um, have <laughs> a little saying about like a growth cycle of a realtor that, you know, when you're new, you know, you're that newborn, you really don't know, you need somebody to really help you to be sure that you're not doing anything wrong. And then you get a couple of transactions under your belt. And now you've become that toddler realtor, you know, and you're trying to run when you can't run and you're doing, you know, you're causing all kinds of trouble saying, I know how to do this. I know how to do that. Well, then pretty soon you turn into that kindergartner realtor, which is sit there, be quiet, you know, follow the rules, play the game right. And then we get kind of cocky with us, you know, I just know everything that's going on. So you know what, you're dealing with me. And then you kind of get old and worn out and you're like, I don't want to, I know, let's just, let's just have a nice transaction. It's not about me. And I know there's a lot of people in this thread that we are all at that point. Where it's like, you know what, let's just go out there and do a good job for our clients and make them happy. And, you know, it also keeps your marketing costs down too, because they tell everybody how cool and wonderful you are and business just rolls in. It's a wonderful thing. Cool. Very cool. Okay. Well, one of the other notes I made um, was on, you know, how to handle a hot market is high deposits. You know, listing agent requesting a high deposit um, to show, you know, that buyer is really very serious. So just the caution in there is, again, watch the liquidated damages amount. Um, you know, you can do the high deposit, but don't tie up more of your client's money than you need to. Just watch out for that. And then um, kind of pivoting, um, you know, if we have a procuring cause issue, uh, one of the things that helps us is, and all the facts are different in every single case. So there, there is a checklist on what's procuring cause, you know, what elements would add up to you are probably the procuring cause and every situation is different. But one of the things that is usually there is you've signed an agency with the, with the client, with the, with the buyer. But remember the agency agreement is not required in California until just before you write an offer. So some agents will do it ahead of time as soon as they, you know, I mean, you kind of think about it. Well, as soon as you're really um, engaging in licensed activity with that client, you should do an agency, but it's required just before you write an offer. So I thought an interesting um, recommendation came up, which is to use a buyer broker agreement. And so right now, if you're showing properties, you know, we have the PEDS, okay? Kind of hope we weren't going to go there, but you know we have our PVs, um, and the question was, well, would that demonstrate procuring costs? There's no definite answer. Maybe because you're clearly working with that person and you have evidence you're showing them that property because you have the PEV form with that address on it. Um, so that could help. Um, but a, the recommendation was to use a buyer broker agreement and list the properties that you're going to show them. And then you go out and now you've got your proof. I am representing this client if we buy this property. 
So I had private messaged the person that made that recommendation. I said, well, what if you're showing properties on another day? What are you doing? How are you facilitating that? And she just says she does an amendment and she adds the new properties each time. So when she has them fill out the new PEDS, then she sends over an amendment. And I thought, you know, that's a good recommendation. And kind of the consensus in that meeting was, you know, we very well may see the resurrection of the buyer broker agreements where more people utilize them because now we are more limited with our opportunities to show properties and we're already doing the PEED forms and that will probably be around for a while. We don't know how long, but if we're already in those habits of having them sign something before we go work with them, we could certainly swap in, you know, a different document and maybe the buyer broker agreement will, will make that resurrection. And with the lawsuits, and I don't want to talk about the lawsuits, I'm not versed on it, but the, the NAR lawsuits of, is it, you know, is it proper that the list that the sellers paying the buyer's agents commission, uh, there was mention that this could be a way to help the case, um, in the future. If it does look like, um, what, how we're currently operating is deemed not appropriate. They don't think that that's where it's going to go. They think we have a strong case in how we operate where sellers paying the full commission listing agent is offering compensation to the other agent. But if it goes bad, this could be a way that, um, you know, we, we remedy that. So just something to keep in mind, you know, if I hear more about that in the future, I'll, I'll share, but again, I'm not well versed on that lawsuit. So I can't really speak to that any, any more than I have. Um, and I just think it's interesting that with how we're operating now, it's making us think about some of the ways we used to operate and maybe some of the things we could go back to or, or some of the ways we could change that will be for the long term. Yeah, I think one thing that's been really interesting about this period of time, at least I, I, I feel this, that the buyers are more loyal now because they don't have the opportunities to be out running all over town doing this and doing that and running into an open house where somebody might tell them what how better of an agent they would be for them than their agent that's not with them at the moment or whatever and so i think it's really kind of an interesting dynamic because you have to have a realtor and it's you know it's going to be interesting to see what if this trend continues of us all getting used to presenting buyers paperwork before they can go in and see something. Um, Cause that's something that, you know, I, I'll say I was very lax at, I probably should, you know, have been a lot better about, you know, getting the agency agreement signed, you know, and, and stuff like that and, and doing a buyer broker agreement, which I've never done. And I probably should really look into doing that. Um, maybe, maybe this is a good time to rethink how we're doing that business. Yeah. And it, I mean, I would love if somebody uses a buyer broker agreement religiously, you know, could share, how do they, how do they approach that with their clients? You know, well, we've got um, a comment. Yvonne says that I use them all the time now. So maybe we can have Yvonne give us a little bit of a tip. And for those of you that put comments in that we haven't talked about, we'll try to touch on all of your comments because I know Inez and, and Pam have a couple of good ones here. So. Well, I don't have anything else on my list. So if you want to do well, that, let's go to comments. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm okay. just killing time. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see. Mary Jane was the first one with a comment. What about cross qualifying? It's my pet peeve. Why do we have to send our buyers' private info to someone that they don't even know? I'm right with you because I don't like that. What are your thoughts, objectively, Lori? <laughs> I genuinely don't have any thoughts on that. Um, I've never done it. I'm, I'm not a huge proponent of it. You know, I think there's value in a listing agent saying, I don't know that lender and, and maybe I don't know that agent either, but I don't know that lender and I trust my own lender. So I want that opinion. Um, you know, I respect that. Um, it's obviously allowed. And I don't know how often it happens. Um, you know, I'm not looking at MLS listings every day to sort of, you know, do some quick stats on it. But, you know, I, I, would, I would venture to say I probably see it maybe a third of the time, maybe even only a quarter of the time. Um, I, I think if you mark out your account numbers, you know, your, your 
watching the privacy, but that's something, I don't know. I, I would, I think the, I think the only real answer I can offer is talk to your own lender and, and ask them, why do agents do that? And what would be a good way to counter that? You know, what can I say to them to convince them that I don't want to do that? Um, I don't generally think the goal of that listing agent is to flip your client to their lender. I think it's more of an assurance for them that someone they trust has looked at it. Um, whether we should be sending it to sending their info is, is more of a personal choice. And I think where we're at is if you don't, then they skip you. You didn't follow the rules. So we're at a disadvantage if we don't. Um, maybe that's something we can figure out, you know, should that be consistent? Everybody does that or should it maybe go away? You know, I don't know, as a group, do we have that power to, to make that kind of change if we think it should go away? I, I don't know, but it's something we, we could try to explore a little more. Maybe some of the lenders in our group can give us feedback too on, you know, what, what they think of it. Yeah, it's really kind of, it's a very interesting uh, comment thread going on. And, uh, you know, I think I've only done it a couple of times when I'm just like, this person seems a little sketch. And again, I don't have my clients give information. It's like, you know what, they've got a full app on file. They got credit on file with the lender that they're working with. If the listing agent wants a cross qualifications, like, why don't we just bring the two lenders together? Like Mary Jane just put in here, let them talk. And then you can find out if something, you know, if, if one's like, eh, something's, something's kind of fishy here. And, you know, and also too, you have to respect the fact that every lender does things a little different. That's why we have so many lenders out there. You know, one person may have an overlay over here that another, uh, you know, lender isn't using. And, you know, so there's all kinds of variables just because one lender can't do it doesn't mean another lender can. You know, I think it's better to have a pipeline of, of lenders, you know, in, you should always have lenders that have various different expertises because not everybody's going to fit with every single lender. And we have to remember that just because one person says, oh, they're good, doesn't necessarily mean that they are. So, you know, and also too, and I'm gonna flip back to the forbearance thing. You know, if, if you're a listing agent and you're like, I want a DU approval before I'm going to accept, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to look at your offer if you don't have a DU approval. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that doesn't get caught. You know, you can get a DU approval and that thing can be friggin' useless. I've had it happen with buyers of mine. I've had it happen come in on listings of mine. There's certain things that do not show up until the lender does the deep dive and it's going to be beyond the pre-approval it's going to be beyond the du approval when there's two things that you're not going to find right now you're not going to find missed payments due to forbearances which many lenders are extending these to homeowners that have no idea what this is doing to their payment history so that's not going to be caught so you can get a du approval and they're going to say this person can buy up to x well guess what they can't buy nothing and nobody knows that until you get into it. The other thing that's not going to show up is tax liens. Nobody's tax liens are going to show up on a credit report. Again, got to do that deep dive. You got to get in there and find out, you know, either from the IRS or their bank statements, um, you know, that, that that's happening. And a lot of people are, well, you know, they should know, they should know. And it's like, really? Do you want to walk up to somebody and say, hi, you know what? I want to buy a house, but I got this freaking huge tax lien. I don't pay my taxes. You know, really, let's think about this. Do you think your buyers are going to do this? Maybe if the lenders you're working with know to ask up front because these things don't get asked is number one, do you have any tax liens against you? Any personal liens, anything that's not going to show up on your credit and they're probably going to, everything's going to show up on the credit. No, you need to educate them that these things do not show up on your credit report. And the other question, especially right now, are you currently in a forbearance or have you been in a forbearance and you haven't made up your payments? Because I think it's, you know, it was really interesting last week. I know I mentioned it, how many lenders said, well, all they have to do is make up all their payments. And it's like, really? You really think that works out quite like that? Maybe for certain people, 
but a lot of these people maybe thought that their business was going to go bad or, or thought somebody was sick and they really didn't. And they, they don't have any idea what they've gotten themselves into because it's not clear. The banks aren't clear. It's, it's reminding me of the wild west of the short sale days when the lenders are like, hey, we're going to do this. Ah, maybe not. Maybe we're going to go do that. Or maybe we're going to go do that. And you didn't know what the heck was happening. And I think it's calmed down a little bit. But again, it's one of those things that the lenders aren't asking the questions and the clients certainly are not volunteering this stuff. So I think us agents need to be maybe asking these questions to our buyers. I know I could have saved myself quite a bit of time if I would have thought to have asked that, but this is all new. This is all new stuff and stuff that we're not used to. Well, I think, and, it, and I think Mary Jane answered her own question, to be honest. You know, I think just having your lender call that other lender mm -hmm. and figuring out how to do that cross-qualification without them actually receiving all the documents is, is the best way to go. I hadn't even thought about that really. Yeah. And also too, if, you know, one thing that I ran into with um, the one client that had the uh, forbearance is that person was not taking no as an answer and he'd get on the phone or apply online with another lender. Oh, yes, of course you're pre-approved. You're pre-approved. There's nothing here to make us not this. And I'd pick up the phone. Hi there. Did they tell you that they had a forbearance and they haven't made their last three house payments? Oh yeah. Pre-approval is no good. Thank you. Five times, five times. Wow. Like so, you know, you're, you're going to have clients out there, um, you know, and, and if you guys are seeing anything crazy out there, bring it up in the, in the comment thread, because this is how we find out about this stuff. I wish somebody, you know, I wish I didn't find out the hard way. Um, and that maybe this information can help you. Uh, let's see what else we've got in our, in our comments. We got a ton of comments. I'm loving it today. We got all kinds of good stuff. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see, I'm not disclosing information about my offers that I've received. You know, this is really good because now I know if these agents have listings, I know how they operate. <laughs> but then again, now they know how I operate too. But it's all good because this is a good bunch of people here. And I know that we're all doing the best we can to protect our clients the ways that we do. Uh, let's see, let's see. Questions, questions, questions. Let's see. <laughs> Okay, love this. Don't speak for the seller. Okay, let's see. And yeah, Pam has a good point. The last sentence in the preamble of the uh, NAR Code of Ethics is it stipulates the golden rule. And that's something I don't think a lot of us realize is even in there. And you know, that's really basic information. You know, we, we should treat each other the way we want to be treated. Because, you know, and that's why I try to go for boring. I like boring. <laughs> Or he makes my life easy. Um, uh, let's see. Jeff said, you just threw the agent with the highest offer under the bus by disclosing their offer to another agent. That's not really what I meant. It's usually before I give the my clients best. It's just like, tell me what, tell me what I need to do. Listing agent, tell me what I need to do. And if the listing agent says, give me your highest and best offer. Well, that's what I do. If the listing agent gives me that window, I can go to my clients and got a window. Listing agent gives me a price. I got a price. It's one of those you don't ask, you don't get. Um, I don't, you know, if another agent called and asked the same question, I'm sure that that listing agent would give them the same answer. So we're really all on the same playing field. But, you know, sometimes all it takes is a phone call and you can get your client that property because the other agents didn't make the phone call. And I think that that's kind of an important point. Uh, let's see, Inez says, I'd like to know if buyer's agents are sending the CBA along with the original offer. CV like Victor or B like Early Victor Alpha? <laughs> oh, you know what? Um, I, I heard that question recently and it doesn't sound like anyone's really using that right now. You know, they put that together. That, that's the coronavirus addendum where when we didn't know the impact of anything early on and we didn't know, uh, you know, what services would be essential, that was to, that was designed to help us agree up front how we would proceed if we ran into a problem. It doesn't sound like anyone's really using that right now because I don't think anyone really ran into any major delays. Um, and if they did early on, it was, people were canceling. Or froze. Oh no. I froze. Lori froze. froze. Come back, Lori. Oh no. Uh-oh. Lori might have to sign out and come back. 
oh, oh, there you are. <laughs> I, I'm still here. <laughs> well, you, you, you weren't with us for a minute. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> maybe it was on my end. I don't know. I don't know. I don't unstable know. connection. When I got the unstable connection. We all know. Uh, I know what you're all thinking. It's all. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that message, so it wasn't me that was unstable. It was me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, so I'll just kind of repeat it. Like you know, early on when we didn't know timing of anything, we didn't know how any of COVID was going to affect our transactions and who could work and who couldn't. I think people use that. Well, I know people use that to set expectations come to a mutual agreement of this is what we'll do if this happens. But it doesn't seem like anyone's using that right now. We all have, you know, figured out how to operate. I haven't heard of any significant delays in any part of our business. Um, although there was a there was a great post I saw from an escrow officer a couple of days ago just reminding us all that hey, all of the entities involved in the transaction, the escrow escrow office, the appraiser's office, the lender's office, the title office, they have humans that are working there. And humans, as we know, get sick or have family members that get sick from the virus or are being homeschooled and now we're on summer. But the point of the message was we need to understand that in each of those businesses, they can't pluck somebody off the street and get them up to speed on how to process escrow. And so it was kind of a... a a subtle plea of just be kind we're we're working hard we're we're trying to not have any delays but the reality is we can have delays in any part of the chain of the transaction and so i thought it was beautifully written um i'll give a shout out to debbie peters for that because it was it was beautifully written and a great reminder that you know again just be kind to people everyone's trying to do their job everyone's still trying to figure out how to operate under these conditions and there are people that have gotten sick and they're just not able to work and the, the rest of the team is is trying to make it happen so, well, so I don't think we're using the cba really at all right now but you know that brings up an interesting thought for the group here is do you have a plan in place in case you get sick do you have a support system already set into place, agents that you know that you can ask for help uh, to, uh, you know, cover your business in case you get it or you're having to take care of somebody. You know, um, I'll, I'll share with the group, we had a little scare at my house this weekend. My husband uh, woke up and wasn't feeling well. And one of the um, uh, things that he had was uh, something that is a common symptom of coronavirus. And let me tell you, if that didn't throw the fear of God into me, I was just like, oh my God, oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? We got to isolate him. We got to do that. We got to do this. What about my business? What am I going to do for my business? And, you know, I'm sending messages to my assistant saying, you know what, this is probably nothing, but I'm going to just plan for this 24 hours from now. I should know, um, but you're going to need to be able to do this. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to ask Lori if she can cover for my inspection and do this and do that. And it really, really got me thinking, you know, how many, how many of us have a plan? How many of us have medical directives set up, um, you know, in case somebody needs to, you know, be making these decisions? Do you have, you know, a policy in place beyond whatever policy you have for your office for your, your team or you as an individual? What are you going to do if unfortunately you're affected by this virus. And if you have a family member, it's gonna suck up a lot of your time. I'm happy to say that that was just a little scared 24 hours later, fine, everything's good. Um, but boy, I'll tell you, I was a hot mess on, on Friday. And that was stuff that I didn't really have in place. I'd like to say, oh yeah, I got this all figured out. Like, no, 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 I have no idea. So something to think about. You might want to take a little time and, and, and just be sure, especially, especially the lone wolves out there. You know, you guys are the ones that it's like, you know, I can do it all. I, I don't need to worry about it. Uh, have a backup agent in place, somebody that you can trust, somebody that you know that, that is, that does business the way that you do it and that can jump in at a moment's notice. So uh, it, it's a, just a little reminder of the times that we're in. And speaking of the times that we're in, I know Pam had a great comment. Now I gotta find it, bear with me here. Okay, 
Pam asks, what do you do when showing property and the agent before you breaks all the rules? Like letting too many people, no mask. We all know nobody's cleaning these houses. I don't care how many wipes they put out for you. We know that ain't happening. What do you think, Lori? You were out showing property this weekend. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I had my I had my cleaning supplies listing agent uh, put in the MLS, bring your own. Make sure you have uh, gloves, booties, and masks, but bring your own. And uh, we went back to the property the following day, and he met me there because he needed to unlock something for us. He was the only one with the key. And no gloves, no booties. <laughs> but he had his mask. Um, so what do you do? Well, you know, if... If you know they they didn't follow the rules, I mean you could you could run in real quick, take care of it. Yeah, you have to kind of decide in that moment: Are you still going to show the property? And chances are you are. So okay, so how do you then now make it safe for you and your clients? So maybe you run and wipe things down. You go in, then you wipe it down as you leave. Um, and then I would notify the listing agent. Let them know, hey, this this uh, showing agent before us didn't have the gloves, the booties, the mask, nothing. Five people in there, you probably got a peed that, so there was gonna be two and there were five. And I would just, I would extend a courtesy to them and let them know. And as we mentioned a few weeks ago, you know, some, some homes have the ring doorbell and they're able to see these things. Um, oh, and I, I didn't share this a few weeks ago and I, um, I think it's a good time to bring it up now. So one of my broker friends had actually sent me a video from the ring doorbell, which her seller sent to her. And uh, the scenario is it's the day of the home inspection and the showing aid, the buyer's agent comes to the property with the buyer who was his sister and her husband and her mom and dad and another somebody. There was like six of them and the home inspector. And on the video, you see a 10 pound bag of ice and a box of two boxes of 12 bottles of beer. Oh my. <laughs> so they had a party. This, it's a great house for a party and it was vacant, but they had a party in the backyard. Was there investigation contingency? I think it was. In the house? I think it was. And Ooh. to make it worse, they left all of their beer garbage and their snacks that they brought in the garbage cans at the house for the seller to have to dispose of. So the seller, of course, saw all this and um, sent the video to his agent, a broker, who then um, called the other broker and said, you know, this is what your agent did. What are you going to do? And so that, that broker did call his agent. She then subsequently received a, a very uh, sincere apology via email. And, and the, the buyer's agent said, the buyer is my sister. And I crossed the line of, of my professionalism because it was family. I think that's important to, to recognize that, you know, with our clients who are not our relatives, we probably wouldn't have done something like that. Well, this group, we wouldn't have done that. But this person would not have done that if it was just, you know, another client. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a, story that's important on so many levels of number one you're being watched number two just don't do shit like that sorry Ooh. okay <laughs> and <laughs> number three you know report it and thankfully that broker took proper action and um and that buyer's agent took it seriously he realized how badly he messed up and, and you, you have to believe that seller now is not going to be very cooperative when it comes to a request for repairs or any other ask throughout that transaction. No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, I just put in here, not my listing, but someone I know. She was a listing agent and allowed the buyers to come with their children to swim in the seller's pool while the home inspection was going on without the seller's approval. Oh, no, no, no. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is, is um, there is an agent out there that puts in their listings, you know, uh, remember most sellers have cameras or audio recorders. So watch what you say and what you do. 
Well, and I found it kind of interesting because it's, it's not telling me if this particular property has one, just generally properties have them. And I, it, it was kind of like, at first I was like, well, no, tell, tell me, tell me if I'm being recorded or not. Am I being recorded or not? And I walked into the property and there's a camera and I'm like, hmm, you know, and, and it was, and it was horrible because there was things in the house that were just too funny. My client and I were going through the house and counting the number of something that was in the house. And then we found out that there was something else that this particular seller liked. She was counting one thing and I was counting the other. And we're like, I hope they're not recording this, but maybe if they are, they'll get some of this stuff out of their house. <laughs> but it was, it, I appreciated though the heads up because it's a little reminder because we don't really think about those ring doorbells. And if the seller doesn't have a subscription going, yes, you won't be recorded. However, if they have a ring doorbell, it's going to go off when you're sitting there on their porch and they can just listen to everything you're saying anyhow. So, you know, you may want to just kind of get off that driveway, kind of go talk by your car, socially distant six feet apart, even with your mask on. Um, just because they're watching, they're watching. And uh, it's really kind of an interesting situation. I think, um, let's see, Daniel Wu says, so because it's your family, you think it's okay to party at someone else's house. Yeah, that agent did. Yeah, that agent did. And, um, you know, it's, and uh, Kimberly put in here, sounds like the buyers are thinking the property is theirs before closing. And a lot of them do. A lot of them, you know, especially for inspections, I think it's, you know, our, our old way of doing things was this is your time to come in and see what it was that you purchased. You came in, spent 10 minutes in a house, made it, you know, I'm going to buy this house. It's perfect. Now it's the buyer's time in to come in and really inspect what they bought. And maybe they want to bring their parents and have their parents see and get their opinion, which we all know you really don't want the parents' opinion anymore. You want to lose a sale really quick. You have the parents weigh in. <laughs> Um, but you know, or they would, you know, they'd have all of their kids come with them or whatever, or, or have the, um, the HVAC guy come and give them a quote on what it would cost for a new system or bring that carpet, carpet contractor in, you know, cause this was our time to do all of that stuff. And now we really don't have that luxury anymore. You know, we have to tell people, no, we're only supposed to allow so many people in the property at any given time. I know you're excited about it. You want everybody to come. And, and it's, this is a hard spot to be in. But I think as professionals, we just have to put our foot down and, and let people know, sorry, this can't, you know, we can't have everybody and their brother in here. You can have that housewarming party when it's your house. Yeah, exactly. You can offer to bring pizza or something. <laughs> okay well we got two minutes left let's see we got a a late ad question here from tiffany due to current limitations how best would you suggest to go about setting up a referral network friends interstate agents social media i'm open to all ideas interesting um a referral network one thing that's really helped me especially in clients going back and forth to Northern California is being involved within the realtor organizations um, in, in or what we lovingly call organized real estate, which I guess without us, it'd be disorganized real estate. Don't know. <laughs> um, but I've been, Lori and I have been involved uh, in California Association of Realtors as directors, as many of you are in this thread. And I don't have a formal network set up, but I know if I have a client heading towards the Bay Area, it was actually kind of funny because what I did was put it out on um, one of the realtor groups. I, I'm not sure if it was YPN or, or what it was. And Yvonne puts in here Women's Council of Realtors. They have excellent resources for a referral network. But I was looking for somebody being referred from somebody that I knew that knew the person in their area and did good work. And they uh, referred Jennifer Branchini to me before I really knew Jennifer. Uh, and before Jennifer was running, a, um, you know, she's very involved in leadership at the time, which I would think, oh, I don't want to call her. She's, you know, she's, you know, a mucky muck and, you know, is really involved. 
And I ended up referring my clients to Jennifer and it was the best, best transaction ever. We call ourselves, you know, team, team Hardy. She's no NorCal, I'm team Hardy SoCal because they moved back here. She sold their house, moved here. I helped them buy a house and it's great because now I have that relationship and I know if I need somebody in that area, I can go and, you know, do, um, you know, just friendly referrals with agents that I know are, are true professionals because they invest their times like we do here, working on educating themselves, making it a better profession. And, you know, some of, some of our best friends are fellow CAR directors and um, that they're just really a lot of really good people out there. Women's Council, you know, Laura, you want to speak to Women's Council? I know you've had a couple of referrals through there. Yeah, um, you know, it's a national, a national uh, organization. And so when we travel to the state level, we meet uh, realtors in the networks across the state. But then if we've gone to the national meetings, we're also meeting others um, across the country. So I think that what you, you suggested is really really good because you know we have access like with women's council you have access through the database to be able to locate somebody you just type in a city and a state and you know the closest person's name will pop up I heard something else um, that I think might be helpful too is to just do some homework on your own of who are the top realtors in an area if you think you may have some referrals in specific you know metropolitan areas you may want to, or even you know destination um, like retirement destination places or where jobs are headed in other states, you know, you could just do some online research and then just reach out to people and, and, and just let them know you are looking to grow your network. You know, you'd like to provide them a little bit about you and you'd like to know about them. I've even received those kinds of emails where they're sending me information about their area and how they operate and they want to learn about me. So if they have referrals, you know, come in my way, they know who they can refer to. So um, you can also go onto NAR's website and look by designations. So if you happen to have a GRI, you can look in the database of who else has a GRI. You know what it took to, to get that designation, the commitment that it requires, and you want to find someone who has that same passion about education and professionalism that you do. Um, there are other designations as well, and um, you could look in their database of people who have those designations. And for me personally, I think that's very valuable because if someone invests in their, in then, in their own education for their own profession, that's somebody I want to work with. That's somebody I would want my client to work with. Um, so those are a couple of different options, but I think it's great to just reach out and, and, and just try to start a conversation via email or a phone call. And just let them know, you know, look, people are moving. There are a lot of reasons people are coming and going. And we just never know. And worst case scenario, we got to know someone that we may never do business with, but we got to know somebody. And I'll tell you, two weeks ago, I got three phone calls in the same week from different agents asking me if I knew someone in another area. So I thought that was kind of interesting because those things happen in little clusters. And I thought, well, I I'm, I'm the connector now. So that's awesome. And also throw it out in this group too, you know, take advantage of our page because, you know, we've got, we're 540 of us, I think now uh, in this group and we, we know people, uh, we can help you. Everybody has people that they know in different areas. Uh, Daniel Wu says YPN and YP, YPN is what got me and Jennifer um, together for that client. And um, you know, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to go to them. And also, too, if, you know, since everything's going to be virtual this year, uh, CAR is going to be having the reimagine that normally is, you know, you go there and have the different classes and see the different booths. Um, it's all going to be virtual this year. And so I'm not, I don't think there's going to be any fees associated with it. Maybe. No. I don't think they don't that. charge for it anyway. Yeah. But there's, there's a lot of realtors that are going to be, you know, doing presentations, doing panels, doing this, doing that, you know, and if you've never participated in uh, one of the live uh, CAR things, you know, this might be a good time to kind of pop in, see if there's something that catches your eye, something that you think you can learn from. And, you know, that's how you're going to find out where, you know, you have an agent in the Lancaster area. Um, or somebody in the Bay Area, or somebody in San Luis Obispo. And the same with NAR. 
Uh, I'm to the point now after going to NAR meetings for four years live, you know, that I, I know enough people that I can say, yeah, you know what, I know a good agent, uh, you know, near a, a certain military base or something like that. And, and it, it helps, it definitely helps. So, um, you know, we're always happy to be a resource for you as well. Yeah, and I'll, you know, I'll just give a, a shout out to, to belonging to different organizations is a huge benefit to your business. You know, there are a lot of trade organizations beyond CAR and NAR that, that do cost money to, to belong to. Um, but if you do have the opportunity, join something because now you're extending your network. You're going to have educational opportunities, but you're expanding that network. And so there's a lot of value. There's so many different organizations, whatever your specialty may be, there's most likely an organization for that. Or just ask around and see who belongs where. I belong to a couple of, of different organizations. Lisa does as well, you know, and it gives us the opportunity to, to, to know people or at least have a connection to others in other areas. And it'll pay off. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, yes, I did get a couple of referrals from Women's Council. So do I hesitate in paying my, my annual dues? No, because it's more than paid for itself in the business I've done. Yeah, same here. I've, I've gotten a couple of referrals. Mary Jane, you know, she's got a pretty impressive number she posted in the comment thread here. Um, so, you know, it's definitely worth getting involved, getting out there a little bit, a little bit beyond your bubble. You know, and the good thing is, is you usually learn something good from being a member of these groups. So I highly recommend it. And speaking of learning something good, I'm going to be holding my FHA VA condo project approval updated revised training session this week. So if you people out there want to learn more about condo project approval, the ever sexy, uh, no, I know it isn't, but it's good information to help. <laughs> We've had a lot of changes and it's going to be Thursday at 11 a.m. We're going to be putting a link in here. I think we're going to be doing a uh, something similar to this, a Zoom that goes as a Facebook Live, but we'll have all the links for you. So if you're interested in that at all, want to find out what's changed, because actually a lot has, a lot has changed since last year. Uh, we'll be holding that uh, class this week, Thursday at 11 a.m., and you'll start seeing it pop up in the feed. So, okay, yes, count you in, yay, thank you. And thank you all for all of the nice things you always put in here. I know we're running a little late, so we'll be respectful of your time, but um, I think it was a good talk today. What do you think, Lori? Definitely. And yeah. it's, always, it's always fun when we get input from the group and new questions from the group, because that just extends the conversation. So thanks everybody for that. It's been another good one. It's been a wonderful one. And we're off to a wonderful start for August. Yay. Somebody light some sage. <laughs> okay, guys, we'll see you all next week. Have a good day. Go out there and sell a house. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.